So we're going over trauma overview and, and the things that I want you to keep in mind for this are, this is, we're gonna start off very generalized with the idea that we're talking about healthy people that would be okay if it weren't for the fact that they were injured. So a couple of things change when we start dealing with this. Um, we're gonna be talking about, just think of a couple terms. We are really gonna focus on MOI or mechanisms of injury, kinematics of trauma. That's just basically like the, the forces acting upon you. And we have to consider that our body is pretty fragile in comparison to like this thing smashing into, right? So high speed traumas, um, ballistics, just like the fact that like people are up on huge three, four, 10 story buildings, like this is all due to the 20th century technology. All of this stuff, the man is not, the human body is not meant to, to handle. So really when we're talking about kinetics, Kinematics, kinematics of trauma or mechanism of injury, we're talking about energy transfer. And it's a huge amount of energy transfer in some cases. Some of the old school stuff like knives and stab wounds and, you know, the bashed over the head with stuff is as old as mankind is. Some of it, though, really is, is due to all of the technology that we've come up with over the last, really, hundred and maybe 200 years, 150 years, really. So industrial revolution and on is all this high speed stuff that we have to manage. When we're doing our patient assessment, this is when C-spine in the very end of our patient assessment, our, our, sorry, our scene size up, the beginning of our primary assessment. Now this becomes something that's very relevant. These patients will be, if they're severely injured, we are going to do a head to toe first, then a sample history. So it'll be a little bit opposite of what we've been doing so far, but that's my mindset on this is our patient assessments. We do the scene size up the primary. We start our secondary with a quick head to toe on our patient, followed by a sample of QRST, just to find out if there's other incidental things about their past. Like it's great, but you know, maybe that we need to know they're allergic to penicillin because of some other thing or latex because we're wearing gloves. But we really need to know about where they were when the car hit them at 40 miles an hour, where it hit them, how they rolled, and look at that body and find out what damage was done to the body. So that comes first. And then we can get into their past medical history. That's my thinking on it. Okay, so we get a little bit more in depth here just to be technical and scientific, we're going to get into, oh, also GCS and trauma scoring. So what we usually would use for the ANO times four, we're now going to introduce a new way of assessing the level of consciousness, which is the Glasgow Coma Scale. We used it a little bit in stroke, but it really comes into play in trauma. And every patient we bring into the ER is going to need a GCS while we're driving in, and then when we get there, it's changed. And then, of course, understanding any transport places that we should take our patients, namely something called a trauma center. So trauma centers have different levels, level one being the best, level four being the lowest, and you want to go to a level one or two if you can. So let's take a look at some of these issues, some of the problems we're going to deal with. Aside from the 20th century being a massive uh, industrial revolution of trauma that can occur to your body, we're also sitting at the prime age group of people that are going to be injured. It's youth and trauma. And this is cars for the first time. This is, hey, I'm an adult now. I can climb up on top of the roof and jump into the swimming pool because I can get up here. And alcohol being introduced. I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense why this is... Uh, when we get recruited into the military or we do wild stuff like the Peace Corps and everything else, you know, traveling across country, uh, traveling all over the world in the name of something, 
it's because we're just crazy enough to do it. So this is one of the major killers of kids and injuries of kids and young adults because what else is going to injure them? This is healthy bodies doing very dangerous things. If they were some kind of genetic predisposition early in life, that might have already affected these kids and they're smart enough not to do anything or they're not around anymore. Um, if they're going to get some kind of medical issue, that's going to happen probably towards the end of their 40s into their 50s and 60s. So really, this is the leading cause of injury on adults and young adults and kids. And it's really because all of this stuff is new and exciting, including alcohol and drugs. I had a wild hair once to put this gif in every single one of my lectures for some reason. He's in a couple of the lunch bed lectures last spring. Anyway, we're looking for what is considered the index of suspicion. That means when we're looking at this patient, we have a Rolodex of all this stuff that we have seen in the past. And we're trying to figure out based on what this patient's presenting with, their signs and symptoms, also based on what the cars look like, what the, the scene looks like, what evidence are we getting there that's going to indicate this is not such a big trauma or we better be looking for underlying problems. That's index of suspicion. So we're looking for potential hazards and mechanism of injury, the way in which traumas occur. So there's high mechanism of injury. And as you maybe have learned in the past, according to Newton's law of conservation of energy, energy can neither be created or destroyed. It just converts or transforms. So we have something like potential energy that when something uh, reaches its client at zenith or at its apogee, uh, that kinetic energy, like the top of a roller coaster, becomes potential energy becomes kinetic energy as it rolls down the hill. And basically, that is what weight, mass times gravity. Work is defined as force times distance. And I think that is one of the questions on the next exam. So, work is force times distance, or it's multiplied by distance. Here's kinetic potential at the top. Oop, down, right? So you see the difference? There's potential for that thing to be, it's, it's basically storing energy. It has the potential to release that energy one way or another. And we show this with like, you know, let's say this is a hill or a roller coaster, but also you could consider a bullet as you know there's potential energy inside that and when the uh the rim or the center punch is, is activated the blast creates kinetic energy for that so there's plenty of non-significant injuries and i'm sure that'll be most of the calls we go on provided uh, there's no nuclear holocaust in the next couple of months, um, <clears throat> which may or may not happen. Anyway, so most of the stuff we see are minor falls, bruising, tears, sprains, breaks, you know, the average stuff that occurs while operating your daily life, doing things, falling out of, climbing upstairs and tripping and slipping and, you know, all of the stuff that you are familiar with. You're not usually around knives and guns and, and all sorts of riffraff on a regular basis, at least hopefully not anymore. It's plastic, something reputable going on. But we're looking for, you know, um, falls. What was that? Let me just go back to that. A fall without the loss of consciousness. So this is a trip and fall. We always have to make sure we know the difference between a fainting or like a near fainting and falling and a trip and fall. You want the trip and falls are a much more simple call to go on. If somebody fainted and fell, now we have an underlying medical problem on top of the trauma and it's a whole other thing to deal with. So falls, 
because they tripped and fell, that's good. Also, they didn't hit their head to the point where they lost consciousness. That's also good. Significant injuries include more than one body system. We call that multi-system trauma. So a uh, vehicle into someone's abdomen, you have all of those organs that have been damaged or the chest injuries, which we're gonna get into in detail on Wednesday, going through all of that stuff that's in there, all the vital organs, the heart, lungs, the great vessels, of course, you know, even the digestive system runs through there, the nervous system, damage to that cage does damage to all of those systems potentially. And so we have to provide for stabilizing and treating all of those things. Fall from heights, this is always nice to tell in like San Francisco, people fall off the roofs while they're up there. People go up on the roofs all the time in San Francisco for barbecue or the, you know, the Blue Angels, we're just hanging out up there, especially like Sunset and Richmond District. When people drink, when people fall off, it's a very common call to go on. So we have to pay attention to how far did they fall? Why did they fall? What did they land on when they hit the ground? Were they conscious when they hit the ground? What are they presenting like now as we approach them? Car versus a pedestrian or bicycle, always worse than a car versus a car. I'm sure you can understand why that would be. Gunshot wounds, those are high velocity penetrating traumas. Low velocity would be stabbing, stab wounds. You're, just, you're not nearly as fast as a bullet going. So that is our goal is to be able to treat that one day. Hopefully never see it. But that is a situation that is a major trauma. Okay, so the next way we break down trauma is in terms of penetrating and blunt injury. Penetrating and blunt injury. And you can have high-speed blunt and high-speed penetrating injuries. Blunt trauma results uh, with force to the body that causes the body injury without penetrating into the soft tissue. Um, so, by the way, soft tissues, we consider skin, muscle, and fascia soft tissue, and, and adipose tissue as well. That's what we call soft tissue. And it gets deeper and it breaks connective tissue, bone, that's orthopedic. So, any injury like falling on something broad, blunt, or being hit with something broad or blunt, like a baseball bat or something, that's blunt trauma. Penetrating trauma occurs from an object that pierces or penetrates the surface of the body. Gunshots, rebar, propeller blades, things like that. And either type may occur from a very variety of mechanisms of injuries. You can have blunt and penetrating trauma. That might be the case with this one. You hit sharp rocks on your way down. You hit big giant boulders on your way down. Things break, things tear open. That is ruthless. Okay, results from an object making contact with the body. So this is most of the time your falls in motor vehicle accidents. Do you think there's a high index of suspicion for that person falling off of a, of a cliff? How would, by the way, how would you get to that patient? That would be a rough call. Yeah, you'd have to probably, so help, fire departments, I don't know if you, you're familiar with the wildland engines yet, but they do have four wheel drive wildland engines. We had something called a brush patrol that was basically a, an F550 chassis, an engine that had a little bit of uh, a dually that had a little little pump and hose on it and a water tank. And then it could also get over a big, large, high angle in, uh, areas in order to do wildland firefighting with two people or to go on those kinds of cliff rescue things. And so you would ditch the engine at the foot of the, the trailhead and then you all jump into the to the brush patrol and go out and then while you're going to that call radioing for a helicopter to find some spot nearer to the patient so that we could load after we've stabilized okay but the big major ones here are going to be car crashes 
And when there is a collision, there's a transfer of energy three different times. The initial transfer of energy is the car against whatever the object is it makes contact with. Here's a pole. It could be a freeway overpass. Uh, it could be another car, whatever it happens to be. That's the first contact that occurs. That's when all of that, all of that matter goes from going fast to slow. It begins to slow down. Then next is the passenger inside the car still traveling at 70 miles an hour, hitting the vehicle interior. And then lastly, the third collision is when the organs of the body smash into the interior of the body. All of the pleura or the surrounding fascia around everything. And that can be, I mean, that's usually where all the damage occurs. That's where that ligament that's in between the right and left side of the liver, that little piece of, of connective tissue that's very strong and doesn't give. That's when, if you're traveling at 70 miles an hour, all of the organs move at 70 miles an hour, except for that one little spot, and it tears the liver open. So that's why liver injuries are such a common thing for us in high-speed vehicle collisions. You don't even have to be hit in the liver. It's just the whole act of stopping and everything moving beyond that ligament, and it tears apart the liver on its own. So lacerated liver is very common with high-speed vehicle collisions. And that's why we just do that big four, upper right, left, lower right, lower left, to assure that none of that's happening. Okay. So in this case, does this look, what would you say, and, and, and this is just use your own opinion, significant mechanism of injury on that, on that vehicle? How bad is that? Is this... Just by looking at that, would you think these patients are code two or code three? Code two, huh? okay. Okay, so what are we looking at when we look at that? Airbag deployment, do we have that? Yeah, yeah we do. Um, what else? Which side is it damaged on? Which side is it damaged on? Maybe on the right side. Right side, passenger side, yep. Okay, a little bit in the left, middle to the middle to the right side. Um, we also look at intrusion into the vehicle. We also look at the vehicle, by the way, but intrusion into the vehicle, meaning how deeply did the outside object impact during the first collision? And if we have intrusion into the passenger's compartment, we're looking for 10 inches or more into the passenger compartment. Now, does that make sense? So if you look, there's smashed, 10 inches into where you would normally be able to move around inside the compartment. So we look at that, we look at engine being displaced off of the engine mounts. Has the engine come in towards the, the vehicle interior? How about the dashboard, did that roll? We look at the windshield, we're looking at something called spider webbing, which means probably a head hit the inside of it and it makes this kind of radiant ripple that looks like a spider web on the, on the windshield. Um, we look at any damage to the steering wheel, is it deformed? And then, you know, any other things that you can find in there, is this thing on fire? Um, do you see that the tires have been broken off? Do we see that the vehicle like rolled multiple ways and over the top and so forth? So do we see roof injury? We also look at the car year. What year is this car? Can you tell? Yeah. Roughly. Yeah. Probably 2000s or something, and that's nice to know because before, I guess the mid to late fifth, mid to late 90s, most cars didn't have crumple zones. I don't know if you've seen what a crumple zone is, but if you look at your car, the door that you open up isn't just a piece of metal and some some framework in there. There's actually about a you know six six to ten inch gap or or space in between that's usually filled with like styrofoam or something. And that is an absorbent. When you get hit on the side, it will take some of the impact. That's what we call a crumple zone. So if you don't have a car that's that age, you're in for big trouble. And this was, you know, all of this stuff was eventually legislated because of how many injuries we were getting from car accidents. Remember, all of this started in 1966 with that 
report on highway and freeway um, accidental death and injury on the freeways. This was just a massive killer of people. People who were in cars for the first time just driving as fast as they could. They didn't have any safety features in the cars. They barely wore seat belts and people would come into contact with each other at very fast speeds and injure themselves horribly. In the case of this, what would you say about that intrusion? Much faster. Okay, good. And we can tell, look, the frame itself is bent. This is a taken apart by extrication equipment. So this is after a rescue or a truck company came in and cut all of these pillars to extricate the patient out of there. Of course, airway bags have been deployed, airbags rather, the seats. You can see this whole dashboard has intruded into the car. I mean, it's a, it's a total chaotic mess. So in cases like this, we're looking at lower extremity fractures where the feet get wrapped up into the gas brake and clutch uh, flail chest the whole steering wheel smashes into the chest cavity and you have portions of it broken in several areas and it just kind of floats as they breathe head trauma of course into the into the windshield or into the, the steering wheel or bouncing around inside the car Hopefully we can find out that were they wearing their seatbelt? Is that something that we can tell in this case? Looks like it was because it's been deployed. So there is, when you get a job as an EMT, you will learn about vehicle extrication. We're gonna do a brief introduction to it, but it's, a, it's something that, again, when you geek out in the fire department, people find fun things to you know geek out on. And then every month or so, every, Weekend, twice a month, there will be some kind of specialized training for firefighters. And you go on the Saturday or something, and somebody will give a, a lecture on vehicle extrication and all the new things that have come out and different devices and electric cars and everything else that we have to concern ourselves with. Okay. That's okay. Okay. But remember, even in cases like that car, it may not be that easy to tell. I've had situations where patients had pneumothorax, they had collapsed lungs, and they were doing maybe 25 and they smashed into a light pole. And it was the wildest thing. You wouldn't think by the mechanism of injury that it would be that severe, and yet it was horrendous. Um, so we it can't always depend on what things look like. Obviously, if it looks bad, think bad. If it looks okay, you should still rule out the most severe, just like we do with medicals, still rule out the most life-threatening and move forward. Okay, so let's look at some MOIs, including vehicle collisions. So we know just based on these specific cases where there is death of an occupant in the vehicle, there's severe deformity of the vehicle or intrusion beyond 10 inches, those patients need to be going to a trauma center. And so there's only one trauma center in Marin County. That's hospital, Marin, Marin General, that's it. You can bring patients with minor vehicle collisions, bender benders and things to Kaiser or, or, or Marin Community. But if you think there's an underlying trauma, that a traumatic injury, that's an issue, you got to send them to a trauma center. And surprisingly enough, it's wild that there's only a level three trauma center in Marin County. You would think with the money and affluence, it would be at least a level two or one. However, it's a level three. And we'll get into what those things mean going forward here. But just keep that in mind. There are specialized hospitals that staff specific surgeons and trauma docs and have specific equipment just for trauma. So what else are we looking for? Severe damage to the rear crashes in which the rotation is involved, either over the top where they roll or they spin. This one rolling the car on the roof is much worse than spinning this way. In fact, a lot of times just this 360 spinning kind of slows the car down before it makes massive contact to something and it lessens the injuries inside. 
ejection from the vehicle. If someone is ejected, they should go just point out right to the trauma center without any other indication that should go. Um, and that means somebody whose hands come off either the handlebars of a bicycle or motorcycle. Whenever both hands come off, technically that's an ejection and they should go. I'm pretty much dedicated to sending everybody in a motorcycle collision to the hospital. It's just too much that could occur. So frontal collisions, we're looking at the brain hitting the inside of the skull. We call that coup, C-O-U-P. When the skull, the brain itself smashes into the interior of the cranium, that is coup. As the head slides back and hits, the second collision is contra coup, just like the video game you were talking about. So coup is when it goes forward, contra or in this case, backwards. Now, if you are, if you're rear-ended and you have whiplash, that initial one is coup. The forward one is contra coup. So we're looking at things like we've mentioned, was the patient wearing a seatbelt? The airbags deployed. The seat belts and airbags are effective at preventing a second collision inside the motor vehicle. Were they? Sometimes they go off. Sometimes they have airbags and they don't go off. Sometimes they go off and patients don't come into contact with them. And those airbags go off fast. And if you're not there to take that shock, they don't do any good. Sometimes you're not wearing a seatbelt, they go off and you're over there when it blows up here. <clears throat> By the way, with the, the airbags, it will, it explodes out. There is an actual detonation that occurs and it fragments a powder. It's a, it's like a, it'd be like a baby powder, only it's not, it's got like crystalline in it. And it's job that powder is to prevent the airbag from sticking to itself as it deploys. But as it comes out, it makes this really foul smelling smoke. And sometimes people think the car's on fire. But what you're looking for is, does it smell like car fire or does it smell like that airbag? You'll know what it smells like once it goes off. Sometimes people get an abrasion on their arms as that bag goes off and their face when they hit the bag. It, blows out, I think, at 270 miles an hour. So as it explodes, it has to blow up and there's holes all along the sides of the airbag so that when you hit it, the air goes out those holes and you go into the bag. Sometimes it's either an abrasion or potentially some kind of allergic reaction or maybe both. It's probably an abrasion. Um, and so you'll see like red in the face and like hives on their arms. It's probably from the airbag itself or that powder. Doesn't mean they're going into anaphylaxis. Okay. So there's your head on collisions. This is a car, by the way, that has very little impact crumple zones on it. <clears throat> so we're looking at, you know, uh, extremity injuries resulting from the second collision. Oftentimes car limbs are caught between cars if it's a, a t-bone or you know a, a perpendicular hit okay. you've been doing this a lot in here and then internal injuries resulting from the third collision all this stuff bouncing around it gets much much worse when people aren't wearing seat belts does anybody not wear seat belts still my father doesn't wear seat belts he's just waiting for it there was an old uh philosophy like in the 50s and 60s, like they said, your seatbelts kill you. You want to get thrown from the vehicle. That was the mindset. In fact, like that's George Lucas got in an accident when he was like 20 or something. He got thrown out. And he's like, if I hadn't been thrown out, I would have been dead. It's like, all right, maybe you're one of the few that that's the case. You want to have a seatbelt on nowadays, kids. So, so keep that in mind. Frontal crashes and side crashes here's a side crash you know just different parts are hitting so you're hitting the parietal portion of the head you're hitting the jaw um all of this stuff comes smashing together so dislocated arms liver hip injuries very common from side crashes what's this 
Oh. Yeah, good. Um, skin looks a little pale. I would be concerned with that color. It might be internal bleeding, the way I look at that. That is not a good color to have. So that looks like a patient who's started to go into shock. That is a significant mechanism of injury. That You have a red bruise across your entire chest and, and abdomen from a seatbelt. You got, you stopped fast. Okay. And those things can damage you just like anything else. Here's a rear end crash. This is what's going to cause whiplash, um, especially in like old roadsters. And, you know, people take these things out on Sunday drives all over here, the coast, they go out to the cheese factory and drive around. And those cars are not equipped for, for car accidents. So hopefully, you know, people every once in a while, somebody gets cocky and they're driving their MG way too fast or their Morgan and and they roll it or you know they get hit and there's again no crumple zones morgans are still they're made with wooden frames um and they don't have headrests so if you get you get a whiplash you're not hitting the back of the, you know think about how important those headrests are here's whiplash so you know uh i knew a fireman who got hit by a car and his head he's a tall guy his face was rubbed raw from the roof of the car he hit it so hard so you you know that's a major mechanism of injury and of course the brain's bouncing around in there happy birthday um <clears throat> you win yeah the one millionth lateral crash so this is what we would call what t-boned or lateral collisions where you're hitting the side and the side impact is not nearly as absorbent as frontal or rear impact. There's a lateral, just, I don't think this is what uncharted. Another lateral impact. Um, yeah, you get the point, right? Bad news. Okay, rollovers. Can you see this? Here we go. There they go. So even wearing a seatbelt, uh, people are still a throne. They're ejected or they come out the, the moon roof or the sunroof when it breaks open. So any kind of rollover is going to cause 360 degree damage to the patient, to the interior, and to anyone else who's in the car. Um, side lap and seatbelts. Are, 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 and, and shoulder straps are not nearly adequate enough to manage something at that mechanism, that speed of injury. Maybe in NASCAR, when they have six or seven point harness systems with neck rolls, neck braces, and everything else, that's going to equip you and you know, keep you a little bit safer. But just the regular lap and the, and the shoulder strap do very little in those kinds of rotational crashes. So, like you can see here, you if you start to roll you want to keep spinning because that slows you down so hopefully what you can see is like in a vehicle that spins out on the freeway you see a nice long stretch of grass or gravel that you see where they had spun and spun for like 200 yards and slowly came to rest on the other end that's a good situation And now you can imagine car versus pedestrian, not a good situation. So there's just, there's no padding for that person. So crosswalks where somebody has, look at that, pretty impressive, huh? Yes, <laughs> all right. These are all very safe, lucky situations here. Boink, lands it, superhero roll, you're in good shape. So that's what everybody, you can do that. Got it? You tuck, you roll, keep your head down and stroll. Um, okay, so sometimes it's not as bad. Let's say it's a stops, it's a four-way intersection and they stop and somebody's walking and they're in your blind spot and you don't see and you go and boom, you hit them on the side. That's one thing. Somebody who's running a red light or doesn't know there's a stop sign there, and, and plug somebody in the other direction, like, you know, out like a, we, 
Um, I used to teach at uh, Masonic. He's a Masonic in the city, and Masonic 4 p.m. gets rolling, and people get smoked out on the, on the crosswalk there all the time because people are rushing to make the, the light. They miss it, and there's people jaywalking or, you know, homeless people in the street, and they, they just they get, they get blasted high speeds. So we're looking at how far from the in impact to where the patient is laying. How far is that? That's going to tell you some indication of speed and transfer of energy. Um, and then if there are any bystanders there, that's going to be crucial for us to figure out how did they land? Where did they land? What did they land on first? Were they conscious when they first uh, were hit? Did anything change by the time we got there? Okay, so evaluate all of that stuff. And of course, as I mentioned, <clears throat> hands off the handlebars, that's an injection. They should be going to a trauma center. Presume the patient has sustained any injury to the spinal column or the cord until proven otherwise at the hospital. So all of that stuff that we work on from holding manual stabilization, collar onto the backboard, strapped onto the backboard, CSM before and after, headbed, then that person can take their hands off. That should be our next big thing after we've learned our patient assessments. That should be just, we can do it with our eyes closed. We can do it at four in the morning, half awake, because that's exactly when we're doing it. Four in the morning when we're half awake, when it's cold out and it's raining and you go, to, oh, he's got to unload this guy. We got to do four tonight. We got four people crashed. Okay. And you're doing them over and over and over again. So we'll practice those tomorrow. And then um, Wednesday is our lab on our chest lab. So we'll practice that a little bit then. Hopefully patients are wearing helmets. The other issue is usually their leathers. They don't want you to cut those leathers off or those um, motorcycle gear. Anybody have that gear? Specific motorbike gear? Don't use race wrap. Yeah, how much is that? How much is it going average leather for the motorcycle? Like, like you're looking at like Right. So you tell somebody who's like, that's their pride and joy. They probably scrimped and saved to get all that money together to buy that the, the leathers and the helmet. We're going to cut it all off. And they're like, like hell you are. I've had to fight hell's angels to take off their leathers. And finally I just go, all right, just stop moving and we'll peel the clothes off you. Will that work? You know, and it's like, hopefully that will be enough. I also know a firefighter who had head trauma and he ended up not making it. But the entire time to the hospital, he was arguing with the ambulance crew not to cut off his clothes, not to cut his leathers off. Um, yeah, well, he didn't die of that. Luckily, he was head trauma. Anyway, there's no lucky in that, but it was a head trauma. And we'll get into head trauma later to talk about how you can tell if this is a large or a slow bleed. Um, those are important things to know while you're dealing with that. So in any case, they should be considered crucial. They should be considered code three transports. We got to get helmets off, which we have to learn how to do that here. We need to also strip them of boots and leathers. And that goes for any patient we're bringing in code three from a trauma. We need to get all of the clothes off. So we'll do a little bit on strip and flip maybe tomorrow on how to cut stuff off. And while you're doing a head to toe, while somebody C-spining will be cutting off, uh, will be cutting off your clothes. So wear something disposable. I'm kidding. No, we have, we, have, we have clothes here we can practice on. All right, let's take a little break. Come back in 10 minutes. No, I don't want you to cut You're not cutting that? Is that card hard? No, I'm not cutting your gear off. Don't sweat it. Where's the pause button? Here it is. Mm -hmm. Why doesn't it just allow that? Okay. You can put this down here. Yeah, there we go. That's what I needed to do earlier. Okay. <laughs> okay.
So motorcycle. Whoops, we got to move though. Okay. So when assessing, look for deformity of the motorcycle, size of the damage, distance of the skid. A lot of times we're, we're, we're looking and estimating skid length. And that gives you, none of it is, none of it is definite because they could have skidded and then got controlled and sped up and hit something else again. So you just do your best, but really just like being on scene of a medical call and you go around looking for medication and stuff and you try and find where it would be in the bathroom or the night tape, nightstand or in the, in the kitchen somewhere. We're doing the same thing, except we're on scene and we're trying to piece together the intersection and which way the car was coming before it was hit. Because a lot of times you look and the car's going this way, the car's going that way, but you find out this car was coming that direction and it flipped and went that way. Like you have to stop and, and analyze the scene and ask bystanders. Police are good at this. We're not. Which way were you going? And then really like reviewing. Okay, so you were coming this way? No, you were going that way. Okay. And you have to like work it through to figure out how fast was each person going? Who ran the red? So not so much who's in the wrong, but who had more speed when they collided with the other person. So all of this stuff, it just takes asking questions, remembering to ask the questions, absorbing what they're telling you on top of working on the patients and like getting all the information and the treatment on the patients on top of everything. It just, it's, it, it's a learned skill. It's like riding a bike. You just have to start getting in the habit of doing that. Okay. Oh, and then also we really look at the helmets. Yeah, that's ugly. Sometimes it's not even your fault. Most of the time, motorcyclists uh, are, are injured by idiot drivers, cars, people on cell phones, people texting, people listening to music, other motorcyclists. It's, it's usually the product of somebody else um, or they're in, they're in somebody's blind spot and they're not seen. That's just, that's just somebody not paying attention. You know, Maybe they're pulling over or the car cut them off and they swerve into that lane. So, you know, you're in bad shape. Boom. These are some serious mechanisms. Look at that. That, that, he gets knocked off his bike. That guy's going what? 10, 15 miles an hour gets hit by a guy doing about 35, probably 35. We could say 40 conservatively. Um, you know, you're busted. And that's all side impact. Whoops. Go back. Yeah, that's usually the case. It's somebody pulling out in front of you going, oh, what? <laughs> you know, it, it just drives me crazy. These are the people that when you are driving code three on the street, they just go, er, they, they'll, they'll turn both, both turn signals on and then they just stop. And you're like, "Get go choose something. Get out of the road, you know? But that, this is where you gain, this is where you build your Zen. Just be like, just calm down. Go around them, go around them, keep quiet, figure your way through the stupids. That's all you can do. Okay, a little bit different. Falls, again, we're still kind of on blunt trauma. Falls depends on the height from the patient, from how far the patient fell. More than 20 feet or six meters, that's considered a activation. Code three, trauma, and I haven't mentioned that to you, but when we take a patient to a trauma center, we call that because of the fact that it's a trauma center. You can, you can take other patients to trauma centers and it could be medical calls or whatever. They're regular hospitals, but they also are specialty trauma centers. All right. When we bring them for the, for the specific reason that it's a bad trauma, we call that trauma activation. We're activating them. And it's usually, if it's a bad one, it's a code three trauma activation. This is a code three trauma activation, 20 feet or more fall. That is a code three trauma activation. So this is the verbiage you're going to hear when you get out working in the field or when you're at the clinicals or the ride-alongs. Hopefully you, I mean, I hate to say that, but 
it's important that you start seeing these things and seeing how orchestrated everything is, how it isn't, but also in the midst of that chaos, the order that actually is going on. And, you know, it's, it's marvelous when, when you work with good crews and busy departments and you go on good traumas and people are moving around truck companies are cutting holes while you're climbing in and doing an interior treatment on a patient. Like it's, it's one of the greatest highs you can get on anything. It's, it's the best. It's better than any drug. And, and you guys experience it together. It's kind of that vibe where I'm sure it's what soldiers feel, except for us, we're saving lives. So when you're repelling and you're doing this stuff and you're working and cutting and people are dying and you're saving, you know, you're, you're starting IVs and everything's working well, there's a giant dopamine rush that you get when you do it right. <clears throat> okay. So in these cases, we're looking for underlying medical injuries. We got to find, if we're looking at the chest, we look for what we call DCAP BTLS. I've said it probably once or twice before we did it in... Yeah in uh, EMR, but D cap B T L S. Remember what this stands for? Which is a simple way, uh, a more difficult way of saying like fractures. That's all that means, breaks. C, which is what? Bruises. Okay. A, which are? Yeah. Scrapes. P. Punctures. Sometimes it's all, they, they always go punctures, penetrations. I don't know if there's any difference. I guess you could consider like a puncture uh, uh, is something that penetrates and then is no longer penetrating. So like a gunshot or a knife. A penetration is like a piece that's still lodged in the patient. B. Bleeding. Bur yeah, bleeding burn. and burns. Good. T, yep, which is just saying, ouch, that hurts. Pain is all it really means. There's pain in a spot. Yep, lacerations, which are cuts. Yeah, and incisions. An incision is a cut made with a very sharp instrument, so a scalp. And swelling. Would you also consider shock? Yeah, no shock in there. I love it. Throw anything else in there that you think shock like symptoms or something, right? You could put shock or like uh, skin signs. Have you seen cool, pale, diaphoretic skin signs? Like that should be in there. Sure. I love that. Nice thing. So, and all of these things, we're looking for those underlying. Do we see any of this to the body? And there's other, we always just say DCAP BTLS. And you're looking for DCAP BTLS everywhere on the body. But then there's also specific things you're looking for too. Like we're looking for blood or cerebral spinal fluid coming out of the ears. That's not in DCAP BTLS, but we're certainly looking for that. We're looking for JVD. We're looking for um, paradoxical chest rise and fall, where there's a portion that's moving independently of the rest of the chest. So when you do your assessment, you can say, we're looking for DCAP BTLS over the whole body. I get it. We don't, you don't have to keep saying it when you get to the chest. I'm looking for DCAP BTLS. I'm also looking for flail chest. I'm looking for, um, you know, bruises. I'm looking for, I'm listening to lung sounds. I'm looking for DCAP BTLS of the abdomen. I'll just go. I know you're looking for DCAP BTLS all over the whole body. But in addition to that, tell me what on these parts of the body you're specifically analyzing or looking for. <laughs> so also remember the transfer, the kinetics of trauma, the energy transfer from someone landing on the calcaneus is displacing the whole tib fib, the patella, the femur, and the pelvis, and eventually up into the back. So this is why people that fall and land on their feet or their knees still need to be C-spine. We have to consider that that energy transfer has gone up into the back, compressed or pulled or whatever it's done and has caused damage there. So we want to, for the most part, every patient 
that is a significant trauma gets put on a spine board with the spider straps neck and the head bit. They, every one of them does. Okay. Unless they won't lay flat. Maybe they can't catch their breath. They have a collapsed lung. They have a pneumothorax or they have a hemothorax or their abdominal pain hurts so much that they keep fighting you. If someone's fighting you to put, and you keep trying to get them in C-spine, they're combative. Well, what's the point, right? At a certain point, if they are doing this and struggling and swinging or they can't breathe, well, they're not, they're already getting, they're already defeating the whole purpose of C-spine. So in that case, we'll have to go around and figure out a way to do like, you know, some kind of alteration to C-spine. So what did they land on? And that's a big question. Was it the carpet? Was it shag carpet, which you still find in some houses around here? Or was it bathroom tile? What part of the body hit that first? And then what happened after that? Was there a concussion? Do they have repetitive questions? Uh, were they unconscious when someone found them? Did they faint and then fall? Or did they fall, trip and fall and get knocked out? All of those things with some kind of change in consciousness is a bad situation. Okay. On now to penetrating trauma. I've seen this. This isn't my own picture, but I've seen something very similar. And the knife was beating. That's actually pretty common. It's not maybe not in the heart, but it's next to it. So the organs are all moving and you see the knife beating. There's a there's an urban legend about an EMT ride along that went on a call like this and was all excited. He was having such a great time and he ran over and he pulled the knife out. And he went, no, 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 don't do that. And stuck it back inside. <laughs> So don't do that. Leave the impaled object in there. It's, it's blocking all of the arteries and veins that it cut. So it's sitting in that spot. They're still weeping. They're still bleeding inside, but it's, it's, it's taking the space up. Once you pull it out, now you've created a hole where everything can leak into. So you don't want that. You want to, if you, if they have to be impaled, you want the object still in place in the patient. So in this case, we're going to need to stabilize this in the location it's at. That means getting blankets or pillows or gauze and wrapping it around this to keep it in place. That's an art in and of itself. Sometimes we just go, we, we got to go. Just everybody mind the knife in their chest. We'll put them on a backboard and let's get the heck out of here so that they can survive to the hospital to get this removed safely. There's another one. This is a, looks like a stick that went right through the trachea, right into the neck and the, the top, the upper um, cervical spine. Neck injury potentially? Yes, absolutely. We got to be concerned with the neck injury. Um, second cause of trauma death after blunt trauma is penetrating its accidental in, impalement intentional by knives, ice picks, or high velocity weapons as well. So here's, we'll go back, go back. That was a large branch. Somebody, car accidents, this is, this is not the only time I've heard of this too. High speed car accidents, people will go into fence pole posts, uh, trees, They'll fall. You can imagine a skydiving injury could be like this if you fall into a forest. Uh, big, big issues to concern ourselves with. Certainly issues to the lungs, great vessels. I don't know if that is, it's a bad, uh, bad quality picture. That's either blood or that's some kind of padding that they put around it. Just imagine this. How, how do you cut it? What do we use? A saw? Saws all you're going to feel, and those things bind up. Don't they? You've used saws all before. You've used saws all before. Circular saw, maybe, if we got it. We don't carry circular saws with, with wood blades. We carry rescue saws with like cement 
by metal blades or for like cutting cement and metal. Um, this might be a case for the extrication equipment where they have like a lopper that's like kind of like a cigar cutter that could work. You're going to have to be inventive. But you're going to also have to be expedient. So as I mentioned, we have low velocity and we have high velocity. The um, major concern with the low velocity is it, you know, it goes in, cuts a big hole and then it's removed and so it bleeds into that space. We also don't know how long, if we don't have the, the weapon, we need to estimate how big that, that knife was. It could be someone's pocket knife, it could be someone's cooking knife or you know, paring knife. And some of those things are you know, for like filleting meats. They're, they're, they're narrow, but they're very long, six, seven, eight, 10 inches long. And so that can go very deep into the chest or into the abdominal cavity. Um, when we get into high velocity stuff, that goes through and can ricochet. It can also cause cavitation or just the fact that there's high energy behind it. It actually tears tissue as it goes through. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, okay. So I think this does something. Yeah, you can see the lungs expanding here. It's a little ruthless. These videos are a little tough to look at. Don't worry, they're tough for me too. Um, but you can see, look, oh, let's cover that up there. Here we go. Yeah, that's a little unruly. So is that lung working? That's the question. Yeah. Okay, and why? Because this is it, what you would consider the epitome of a sucking chest wound. Oh. So when they're breathing, all you would be doing is just moving air in and out of the top area right here. You would just be moving, when you move your chest in and out, it would not expand the chest. The only way this chest is expanding is because they have a bag valve mask attached to the, the endotracheal tube. Yeah. Would you be able to see through the chest? If yeah, through? yeah, Can yeah. You see it right now? That would be the flail segment that's gone. So I wonder what that was that did that. It looks like a big, big, large object that kind of came through and tore that open. Let's move on from there, shall we? Okay, so here we go with high velocity. This is a bullet theoretically traveling through and you can see that as it goes into the tissue, the aerodynamics of it then no longer apply and it starts to go in and roll around. It can bounce off of organs, it can spin inside, and that's just a solid point. They have hollow points, there are, there are home defense rounds that just have little BBs inside. So they go in and once they make contact with tissue, they blow out and they either become little shrapnel shards or BBs or whatever you got. So it does a lot of damage after it gets into the body. There's also going to be, because of the speed of this, there's going to cause like a, if you're watching somebody water ski, you get that wake behind there. There's a wake of air that's traveling through here. You'll see in the next video with ballistic gel. Um, you see that? Watch this, boom, rip. So it causes us that wake and that's tearing all the tissue. And then as it comes together, just everything kind of erupts. Would you consider anything Below that's not hit directly uh, by the bullet to have, uh, have lung force profits up to even like, if, if they were to stop it? Like, let's say I got shot like, on like the lower left half of my body. Would you consider any organ, like let's say my heart, would you consider that to have like any form of like trauma from that ripple? I mean, it, it could be penetrating or yeah. Yeah, I guess you would call that blunt force trauma. It's concussive trauma is what it is. It's like a blast injury, but you, you it's it would not be, yeah, uh, any, any, it's all fair game. Once it goes in, especially, if it, this is, let's say, like a hunting round or something with a large amount of, of powder behind it, 
those things travel with a huge amount of velocity and, and, and inertia. So um, everything inside can, can be damaged. Okay. Um, as they go through, usually, not always the case, but usually the entrance wound is much smaller than the exit wound. And that's because that usually travels through and blows out the back end. So all of the tissue kind of travels on through and blasts out the back area. And so we're dealing with velocity in terms of what's causing damage, not just size of the round, but the speed at which that hits the body. <laughs> Look at that, that's amazing. Getting into high velocity on a large scale blast injuries. Um, we're seeing a lot of these right now. Um, and definitely we're gonna see more of these in the future. But most common in military conflicts, mines though, they can also be in things like shipyards and chemical plants because of the chemicals that are factories there. This is explosive. Uh, they, they're mixing or creating explosives there. Certainly all of this stuff can be used uh, as, a, as a blast, as blastable material. So you can see here, that's the shock wave traveling through. That first part blows in the shockwave. And look, you can see it hit the buildings and knock, break glass, knock off all of the, what, concrete atomizes. Do you see that? It's a really cool image. It's probably, no, that's all the concrete. That's all the building materials just vaporizing. A boom. And of course that hits. So there's some issues that can occur because of blast injuries. Um, you do damage to the different organs in different ways. So there's the primary blast that sends out that concussive blast. That concussive wave in and of itself can blow your hollow organs. So lungs will burst, intestines will burst. Anything that has air in it, or in some cases, partial air and fluid, those can explode due to the initial blast. Then you have the second blast where the projectile, well, whatever was inside that bomb, let's say, or if it were the canister of a, a water heater or something, that becomes shrapnel. And that's now traveling faster than sound. That can go penetrating the body parts uh, blow people, you know, blow open doors and get people behind those injuries. The la uh, sec third one, tertiary blast, is like being hit with the door. If you're behind a door and you blow it, the shrapnel and the shock wave hits the door and the door blows in and knocks you, you know, hits you, strikes you on the face, hits you in the chest, whatever it happens to be. And the quaternary or the fourth injury that can occur is after you get thrown from all of that you smash into a wall or let's say you fall off the ledge of a building and you're then blown off that building and you hit on the ground below so there's four different cases of potential for in, for injury due to the blast just like with a car high speed stopping you have the three different collisions there you have the car stopping you have the body inside smashing into the interior of the car and you have the organs smashing into the interior of your body here you have the shock wave the shrapnel wave the shrapnel knocks debris around wave hitting you and you then being thrown and having injury done to yourself as a product of you being thrown Okay. Also included in that fourth blast are burns from the gases or the fires that are started by the blast. And that can cause respiratory injury, smoke inhalation, <clears throat> injury to the body due to that, that fourth wave. And usually 
it's not just one of those four that you're injured by. It's all, all of them are going to get you in some way, particularly if you're close enough to experience the shock wave and the shrapnel wave. You're, you're going to have a mixture of injuries from all of those things occurring. So what we're concerned with in a case like that is what we call multi-system trauma. And th this is really just what you get on major traumatic events. It's not just, well, he had uh, his uh, pneumothorax. It's not just a collapsed lung. It's usually a collapsed lung with flailed chest, with a hemothorax and a pneumothorax, with some damage and bruising to the lungs, and also perhaps some dissection of the large vessels. There are m many different things. There's no picking and choosing. It's, it's very, you know, it's very general. When you get hit by a car, it's just going to hit everything in that spot. And a number of things are going to happen in that area to all the different organs. So this is why we see spine. We spinally immobilize every patient just to make sure if in addition to the chest trauma, there's some head and neck injuries, we're providing for that. We're, we're stabilizing, we're transporting them, we're moving them around with that at least mitigated. Okay. So in this case, this is kind of what we were built to do as EMTs. This is our job is to get to these big, difficult calls with massive multi-system trauma, stabilize ABCs, strip and flip, look down the whole body, try and figure out if there's any underlying issues that we need to be concerned with, package them safely on a backboard, and rapid transport to a trauma center. Like this, this is it. This was our main goal. And then after, it almost is an afterthought, well, we should be able to go to homes too and, and work on elderly and everything, sure. But let's make sure we cover the freeway injuries and accidents and we can do something about that. So this is where our taxpayer money has gone. And this all is that golden hour of emergency care, the golden principles of pre-hospital trauma care, that one hour from injury to surgery. So you, you'll also hear from insult to surgery. From the moment the patient is injured, not the moment we get dispatched or the moment we get on scene, the moment the patient is injured with a life-threatening injury, then that's when that clock begins. That's when the golden hour begins. And well, sometimes their injuries are so bad that we're not gonna make it to the hospital. I mean, if you, if you have a head trauma and they're decapitated, it doesn't matter how quickly you get them to the hospital, they're, they're done, that's, that's it. But if it's an injury that, although it's life-threatening, can be stabilized by us, the goal is we get them to the hospital, into the operating theater in under an hour. And that can be really tricky because we have to get there first of all. So somebody has to alert us in time. And then whatever we're doing, let's say we're, you know, we just got back from a fire, we're showering or we're working out or we're having dinner and that call comes in. We've probably lost about five to 10 minutes already from the time that the injury occurred to the time that somebody picked up the phone and called 911 and decided, oh, I'll be the one. Okay, we're at, and I, I don't know where I, the overpass is. Where is this over? Is this paradise? What's this overpass? I don't know. Well, I passed paradise. It's somewhere between paradise and the, and the Mill Valley exit. And they have to then say, all right, which fire department is that? Do we call Tiburon? Do we call Corte Madero? Do we call San Rafael? Who do we call? That takes time. And then the right station gets rung down and those people have to get up and they're either hustling or they're dragging you know depending on what's going on this is why it's important to be ready to go when you're there at work and when you're getting off the rig you got all this stuff on then we get there we have to package that patient safely we have to put them in the right stuff we got to stabilize abcs and that has to happen on scene remember we're not just some ambulance company that runs in, throws somebody on a stretcher and, and, and leaves. We stop, we stabilize. If there's any issues with airway, breathing or circulation, they're not gonna make it to the hospital. So we have to handle that on scene as quickly as we can. 
sucking chest wounds, hand over that area, not breathing, bag valve mask, start it on scene, get them to the hospital, giving artificial respirations. That has to occur. We got to then find the right center to send them to and rapidly transport after we got them packaged. And then the hospital has to have room and ready for them when they show up. So that can be really tricky, especially if someone's stuck in a car and we got to cut them out. That's going to take another 10 minutes at least. Um, and it's just, you know, the logistics of doing this are, are tricky. That's why it, even when you get a job in a busy department, you train, you train and you train and you train. And sometimes you cut cars open, even though you didn't have to. If that car is considered totaled on scene and the patient can get out, Maybe you spend a couple of minutes after with your truck company cutting that car up just to get in the habit and the use, the comfort of using those tools. It's important because that stuff, when life is on the line, we got to be able to do it efficiently. So always remember, it's not just the safety of the patient, but it's our safety. Are we able to get to this patient and work on the car that's laying on the side or on a cliff? We got to operate safely on that. How do we stabilize? That takes time. How many people do we need there? We're going to have to dispatch more people. That takes time. All of these things need to be considered early on. This is why we do it in scene size up and why we should call the world first. And then you can always cancel them if you don't need them. So as much as it sucks to be sitting around, you're playing volleyball or something, and you're like, oh, they're calling us on this. It's way up there. We're never going to get used. Okay, so what? Good battalion chief, a good officer knows, call people there early and cancel them off if you don't need them. There's nothing wrong with that. And it's, it's good to see that with people if they're thinking in advance. You should do the same thing. Not only because the, the pros do that, but because you're not a pro. So you should just call everybody that you think you might potentially need and just say, I, I didn't know. So I was better safe than sorry. And I called everybody to come. And then when an officer or another truck or engine company gets there with higher training than you, they take over and then they can cancel off whoever you need to cancel off. But, you know, don't feel like you're putting people out by getting them up and rousting them and bringing them to the call. That's important. Okay, so always, and that's again, why it's in scene size up that we call for additional resources. It's not somewhere in the primary or the secondary. It needs to be done before you even step out of the rig. So identify, manage the life threats, focus on patient care. And in this case, instead of going A, B, C, this is when we start doing C, A, B. Circulation or hemorrhage first, followed by airway and breathing issues. We can do stuff with certain hemorrhages, certain arterial bleeds we can put a tourniquet on. We can direct pressure. We can pack the wound. Those things save lives. Don't be afraid to apply a tourniquet, even though it hurts. Don't be afraid to pack a wound, even though they're screaming. It has to be done. And we're treating for shock, and we're stabilizing with all of that in mind. So we call the time on scene the platinum 10 minutes. So there's the golden hour. And while you show up on scene, we're hoping the minute you step off the rig to the minute you get the patient in the ambulance and you're driving off is under 10 minutes. That's the platinum 10 minutes. There should be something for like the first minute on scene because that first minute on scene, maybe the diamond 60 seconds or something. Think of, think of something that would be good there. Should be a precious metal, right? That first minute, especially in calls where there's like multiple patients on scene, you're gonna need to call dispatch, tell them what you see, tell them what you need, and then go and triage and walk through each patient without doing any care What's wrong with you? What's wrong with that person? Are they awake? Are they alert? What's their GCS? What's their chief complaint? Go to the next person. Who's that? What's wrong with them in that car? Okay, go to that. What's wrong with them? Then you come back to your crew. Maybe they've split off and they went and talked to the other people in the other cars. 
you come back and you go, I got one patient unconscious, one patient with a flared chest, one person's walking wounded. And they go, I got one person who's missing an arm and the other two are screaming and they're trying to stop the bleeding. And you go, okay, let's get, let's get your patient with the arm handled and we'll go to my unconscious patient and we'll go to my flailed chest patient after that. And you have to then figure out an order of who's going to die first or who, you know, is going to die, but still has a chance of living, go treat them first and then work your way back down to the less, the less severe injury. Okay. So in this case, we are going to be doing head to toes first, followed by sample histories. And this guy does a great job on those. So let's watch a patient do a uh, head to toe, a good, a good patient assessment here. So that's the, the thinking there is you get your ABCs, you do a quick focus to be like, what's wrong with that thing? Is this going to kill them? And if so, let's treat it right now. Somebody throw a tourniquet on that leg if they needed to. Um, he gave oxygen. We could think about in that case, I like a non rebreather for somebody breathing 30 times a minute. If, if they're breathing out rate faster than that, just going... <laughs> Maybe you need to put a bag valve person on bag valve to give more breaths to that patient because you can't breathe faster than 30 times a minute and actually good, get good gas exchange in the lungs. That is a rare occasion. What you normally will have is somebody whose respirations are way below 10 a minute. And those are the patients that we have to bag. Those are the ones that we have to assign someone with a bag valve mask somewhere like eight or less respirations a minute. That is handled in the primary. That's found with a focused assessment. And then you can go on with the secondary. And as I mentioned for traumas, I do a head to toe followed by a sample. He said something about he would get a sample if the patient was conscious. That's fine. You know, there's no hard and fast rule about this. So you can decide when you want to get it. I just think to me, it makes more sense. And I know I'll remember it to give a head to toe on a trauma first, followed by a sample and do a sample first, followed by a head to toe on a medical call. It just makes sense to me. Okay. What down got the vital signs of what was the additional vital signs that he, that he attained at, at the vitals. I didn't catch which extra vitals he did. Did he get blood pressure? Okay, yeah, but he, he had already gotten pulse and respirations beforehand, right? Because he got pulse yeah. 130 and weak, respiration 30 and weak. So he had that already. He just went and got, because in these scenarios, we are by ourselves. Don't bother with getting a, a, a blood pressure. Don't worry about getting a blood pressure in your primary, but certainly you got to, if you're checking ABCs, you got to check pulse and respirations, which is what occurred there. Okay. But remember, if you are more than yourself, feel free to get a blood pressure on scene. Feel free to get patient on oxygen in the primary. Get that done right away. You get your vital signs first, and then you have a baseline to see if your treatment is doing anything, if it's working or if it's not. So we'll practice that if we have some time today afterwards to do a little bit of a, um, head to toes and work on this again, just to get in the habit of it. Okay, lastly, you saw you did a head to toe and that's the order of priority. You saw he did exactly how we do it. Head, neck, chest, abdomen, legs, out to the arms, check the back when, you, uh, when you're gonna roll them over and, and put them on a backboard. After you have the patient loaded up, or at least on the backboard getting into the ambulance, you should be thinking trauma center. Where's my trauma center? Where is the quickest route to these trauma centers? Which ones do I have at my disposal? So we're gonna get into the different types, the different levels of trauma care that you can get at specific uh, centers. So we take the most significant injuries that we talked about, falls 20 feet or more, for children, it's double their height. So if a kid is 
four feet tall, he falls for longer or sorry, further than eight feet. That's considered a trauma activation. Certainly if the kid is unconscious due to that. Um, intrusion into the vehicle more than 10 inches, steering wheel crushed, ejection, death of an occupant in the vehicle. All of those different um, mechanisms that we're paying attention to, we should decide that we're going to a trauma center of some level. Whatever one we have, that's the one you're going to go to. So we take our critically injured patients on a trauma activation. Usually in large urban cities, you're going to have at least one level two or level one trauma center. Here we have a level three because it's not urban enough, simply not enough people per square inch getting injured that badly. So a level one facility has every possible aspect of trauma care. They have the ability to have head trauma, chest trauma, GI, abdominal trauma, orthopedics, soft tissue injury. And there are specialists on call or literally working 24-7, 365 at that hospital. Maybe they might have a pager and they live either in the hospital somewhere or just off campus. And they can be paged when they're on call to get there by the time you arrive there. In addition to having specialists in each field, they also have all of the equipment they need, like CT scans and MRIs, and they have operating rooms and everything that they're gonna need for that. In addition to that, a level one trauma facility has to be a teaching center as well. So this is where all of the interns, all the resident doctors are coming to practice with the professionals, learn the techniques, learn the skills, and you know, become the professional that they want to be. So in San Francisco, it's San Francisco General, SF General. Technically, UCSF is considered a level one center, but everybody brings their patients to SF General. It's just, they're, they're the trauma center for that city. If you had to, if this is maybe a multi-casualty incident where you got 30 people, you bring them all to San Francisco General first, and then you're gonna take them to UC second, distant second. You may even think of traveling across the bay to Highland or to Eden or somewhere like that, because those are also known for their trauma care. So a level one facility, in addition to having all of the different specialists and equipment, is it also, it's a training center. It's, it's, a, it's attached to some organization of university or vocational training or something where they send the students through that, that level one training facility. A level two, same idea. However, it's not considered also a teaching hospital. That doesn't mean that they don't have ride-alongs and nurses and nursing and, and paramedic interns going through there and doing their clinical hours, of course they are, but it's, all, it's not one usually for doctors, it's not for surgeons and physicians. So level two, pretty much you're just as good off going to a level two as a level one. The only difference may be just the, um, not, the amount of, of traffic through a level one is much higher so people are just trained more. You just, you wanna to go to a place where there are a lot of people to an extent that they're not burnt out or too busy to pay attention to you and people die in the corners of the hospitals, which I'll tell you happens sometimes at San Francisco General. I walked as a paramedic clinical student, walked by a room where in the corner, somebody was in a respiratory arrest. No, nobody knew and I happened to go, that person's blue and we walked in and sure enough was not breathing. We had to ding the, hey, somebody, somebody come help me. I don't know what I'm doing. And um, yeah, that, that can happen. It gets so busy that people get lost in the area in, in any case. 
for the most part, if you're the center of attention, you want it to be with people that are running calls every day, multiple, multiple times, and have been through the ringer. And you know, your little call is nothing. They got that one handled. Okay. A level three is what Marin General is. Provides assessment, resuscitation, emergency care, and stabilization. Transfers patients to level ones or level twos once those patients are stabilized. So they do have limited trauma surgical care to stabilize the injury. But then if there's something that's involved in that that needs to be managed further, they can send the patient to a specialist at a level one or two training center. And then of course, a level four, it's just kind of remote outlying areas. These are the ones you find in rural parts of the country. They usually can stabilize. They have a number of the devices and specialists on, on call every day, but usually they will then take the stabilized patient and either fly them out by chopper or rapid transport by ambulance. It's usually, these are the ones that you see in the city that fly them out. Okay. So they're, they're getting rid of the patients, flying them out. Okay. So remember that this, this whole golden hour and everything needs to be handled as quickly as we can when we're dealing with like extrications and, and patients and the amount of time it takes to, to get a helicopter in the air they have to check all their stuff before they get going they have to do a flight check they got to know where they're going we have to map out a location for them to land so there's all these other things we got to manage like you know how big does the area have to be it's usually 100 by 100 square feet and you can't have trees or telephone lines or overhead obstacles of any kind you want it to be relatively solid ground where there's not debris that can be kicked up by the rotors you need to be able to get there with the patient, drop them off, and then they load and they can take off. So there's a number of things that you need to be able to manage before you get going to the hospital or before they land and take that patient off. So in addition to that, we also need to have a pediatric, some places in San Francisco, well, they go to, they go to San Francisco General in the city, but, in Oakland, you have children's hospital as well. So they may be the one you bring the children to for trauma center, and you would bring the adults or the patient, the parents to um, Highland or something like that. The key to these are remain calm, complete your assessments. Now you saw that one on the leg, that's what we would call a distracting injury. And sometimes those are wide open, big, tears, fractures, open fractures, bleeds, that will take all of your attention away from the collapsed lung or the lacerated liver. So we have to be sure that we get a full assessment on our patients, that we're getting CABs, you know, make sure that you've checked for bleeding elsewhere and that you're managing it as well as their breathing. It's absolutely necessary that you don't get distracted by those distracting injuries. So we correct, do quick assessments, don't injure them, get off the scene, never hesitate in any of these calls to call for advanced life support and additional resources early in the game. And that's it. Do we have any questions about rapid trauma care and assessment? We're gonna have some fun with it this, this semester. So let's, um, we'll break now and we'll practice doing head to toes on each other. The rest of you that need this, the uh, quiz, we'll do that now, okay? All right, I'll be walking around. We'll take another break right now. Yeah, 10 minutes.